Welcome to the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. I'm Gretchen Marie Schaefer. I'm the director of REMCAD's Visiting Artist, Scholar, and Designer program, which many of you, of course, know um, as the VASD program. This program is an interdisciplinary initiative that values passionate curiosity and explores critical, diverse, and creative inquiry through a variety of events and presentations. We are very honored to further enrich the academic experience for all of our students here at the college and to serve the greater Denver Metro community. Tonight, we're excited to present the third artist talk in the VASD program's year-long pattern series, which explores the multifaceted and dynamic nature of repetition in contemporary art and culture. From DNA to data, from ornamentation to textiles, from history to habits, the universe is full of order derived from chaos. And as life becomes increasingly complicated, the power of predictable groupings and regimented, simple narratives grows increasingly alluring. Through next April, this series will explore the human desire for symmetry, categorization, and repetitive alignment at a time when social and political progress simultaneously aims for a more nuanced and intersectional perspective. And I am thrilled to have Sarah Swinar here to contribute to our pattern series with her talk titled On Kitsch, Color, and Popular Imagery. Swinar was born in Vancouver and currently lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. She holds an MFA from Yale University and a Bachelor of Design degree from York University in Toronto. Her work has been exhibited at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and in the notable exhibition Greater New York at MoMA PS1, among other locations. Many, most recently, the Museum of Modern Art in New York commissioned Swinar to make a series of films that stream on the museum's website and social media platforms. Her 2013 book, Kitchen Cyclopedia, gained her critical attention for her consideration of how familiar sentimental images smooth over unpleasant realities. Swinar's work merges the problematic aesthetic of nostalgia, the glossy allure of advertising, and the proliferation, saturation, and inundation of images in the internet age. Both her circular methods of making and resulting layered artworks present a nuanced view on pattern that is both visually captivating and vitally contemporary. Taking the form of books, photos, and films, these works divulge the effects of abundant, luscious, repeating images on our psyches and politics, sometimes utilizing the very techniques of manipulation the work simultaneously critique, bringing an often subconscious persuasion into consciousness. Swinar will discuss the role kitsch and politics play in forming a shared worldview and how images operate in and sometimes progress through a cycle of monetary and cultural value and obsolescence. It is my great pleasure to welcome Sarah Swinar. So I'm Sarah and I'm gonna talk for an hour, a little less than an hour, about kitsch, color, design, popular imagery. And I'm gonna talk pretty fast, and I'm gonna try to show a lot of stuff. Um, and I'm gonna kind of jump back and forth through time. So, um, without further ado, I'm gonna start with the first art project I ever made. Um, and then second, I'm gonna show something that I just finished a few weeks ago. So this is the first art project I ever made. Um, it's called Kitchen Encyclopedia. It's a book. Um, it's also a graphic design project. It's um, an art project. It's kind of like a conceptual, um, I don't know, like a theoretical text mixed with personal writing, which is a mode of working that I still use a lot. But I made this book in my last year of undergrad, so almost 10 years ago now, in its first iteration. Um, and I'll just flip through it while I give a bit of my background. So I started as a graphic designer. My undergrad degree is in graphic design, as Gretchen mentioned. Um, I worked for three years as a designer at the New York Times Magazine before I quit to focus on art. 
Um, and my work is really informed by thinking about how design works and how what I'll call popular imagery works. Um, so by popular imagery, I mean a sort of shared public archive of images and designed objects that kind of shape or form our worldview and that reflect the world back to us, um, that come at us through books and magazines and history books and encyclopedias and increasingly through the internet and Instagram. Um, and in my work, I'm kind of collecting examples of these types of pictures and reforming them into my own books and films and photographs to try to think about how they kind of get into our minds and work on our psyches and how some images have staying power while others only last for a brief moment and to try to think about what they're actually doing to us. Um, so I pull from photographic history and from design and I have a kind of big personal archive of this type of popular imagery that I keep and reuse and it comes back again and again. And this is sort of the first project where I started forming it into something. Um, and I look a lot at a recent past to try to think about what that could say about the current moment. So looking back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, this kind of um, modernist, idealist era of the recent past that it sort of shaped a lot of the ways that we think now or that we've kind of, um, we're, we're discarding this way of thinking, but we're still living in its residual effects. So I pull a lot from this kind of more optimistic period in a Western past um, and combine it with images and objects from right now to try to think about what's changed and what hasn't and to try to illuminate the present. Um, and in all of this, I'm trying to situate an individual approach within the kind of mess of images and texts and stuff that comes at us and to try to think about how it feels to actually live with these things. So it kind of starts from a theoretical standpoint and starts with a really public kind of um, shared set of images but then trickles down to the personal. Um, so this book um, begins with a definition of kitsch that is different from the usual one that we think of, I guess we usually think of kitsch as the kind of ironically appreciated popular or uh, products of popular culture that we kind of don't take too seriously. Or kitsch can also be um, something that started off as high culture and then became kind of generally regarded as not that good anymore. Um, but in this book, I'm thinking of a sort of more sinister definition of kitsch. Um, put forward by the Czech writer Milan Kundera in his book, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, um, which is sort of a cheesy romance novel. I mean, it's fine, but it's not a great text or anything. Um, but the definition of kitsch is very useful. Uh, Kundera, and it, I think, is like increasingly relevant to thinking about images right now. And by images, I mean I, like shared ideas and actual physical images, just to make sure that's clear. Um, so Kundera sees kitsch as the kind of idealized imagery that we look at in order to ignore all that is not aesthetically appealing about life, most fundamentally that it ends in death. Um, so for him it's like this really big existential question, it's about how we use images to sort of imagine a world that's more palatable or more digestible or easier to understand than the one that we're actually living in. And it's also about how images get used on us by those in power. So kitsch could be a religious movement to the left or right. It could, I mean, sorry, a political movement to the left or right, a religious icon. It could be an advertisement. Um, he says, kitsch causes two tears to flow in quick succession. The first tear says, how nice to see children playing on the grass. The second tier says, how nice to be moved together with all mankind by children playing on the grass. It is the second tier that makes kitsch kitsch, which is kind of a crazy line, but it's, I think it kind of um, condenses the whole thing. It's about seeing with a collective eye or seeing with an imagined public in mind or sort of seeing how you think you're supposed to see based on all the other images you've seen before instead of just looking at what's in front of you. So these are ideas that continue to come up in everything that I do. Um, and while I was working on this talk, I realized that this first book kind of 
coincides directly with the last project I made, like that these ideas of the way that images are used to sort of imagine some sort of truth or um, something better than the kind of chaos that we actually live in, um, how I'm still sort of trying to work through that. So the next project that I'll show is the project that Gretchen mentioned for MoMA. I'll give a brief introduction before I show it. So MoMA, as some of you might know, just reopened after a renovation and they closed for three months and they're trying to recontextualize their collection and to kind of um, bring forward artists who may have gotten lost and to kind of change the really specific sort of hegemonic view of art history that is the MoMA collection. Um, and they asked me to go through the collection and make a new work that would first be shown on Instagram. So I was really excited about working for Instagram, actually, like maybe more excited than if I was making something for the museum. Um, <laughs> I wanted to sort of think about what this like unimpeachably valuable collection would mean shown through your phone and what I could do sort of translating one big thing into this other thing. Um, and the kind of pace with which we look at art versus the pace with, with, with which we look at things on our phone um, seemed like an interesting dynamic to work within. Um, but I really didn't know what to do. They said I could have access to all their archives, like internal memos, um, documentation of everything that ever happened there, um, like every picture that ever was shown, for example. And it was just very overwhelming as starting an art project always is, but I just didn't know what to do. So um, I started looking back at other people who had kind of made work trying to pull apart how art works on us, which is a lot of people, um, but I fell on a really classic one, which is John Berger's Ways of Seeing videos. Um, and they're these videos from the 70s that he made for the BBC. Um, which I was sort of seeing the BBC, like public television in the 70s as an analog to the way that Instagram works now, um, like reaching this huge audience through public TV versus MoMA's four million Instagram followers. And I wanted to kind of take on his way of working for my own project and to think about what it would be like to make something like that today. So he sort of spoke in very accessible language but dealt with really theoretical ideas, which is what I'm always sort of trying to do, whether I succeed or not. So he was trying to talk about how the kind of value, or how television and commodity advertising were kind of using the value and the um, aesthetics of art historical images in order to seduce consumers, basically. So how art was getting kind of refolded into capitalism in order to sell things. And he looks at um, historical painting, at television, and at advertising in order to demonstrate how these power dynamics work. Um, and I similarly wanted to explore how art and images get used to um, put forward certain social values and norms and to reinforce them, and how we come to think that some things are good and others aren't. Um, so I'm going to show three of the videos now. They're just one minute long because they're made for Instagram. So I, and they're very in, like, intense because I was trying to stuff as much into one minute as I possibly could and also to sort of think about the chaotic, to, to match the chaos of Instagram, if you will. So here's the first one. I'll only ask one minute of your time. In the first chapter of this history that someone else wrote for me, seeing the way we're taught to the see, things that seem sayable or knowable are given to us by objects like these, by images, by paintings, handed down, placed upon us. But who decides? Stature, status, statues, a new thing must eclipse each old one as long as everything is going well. MoMA design classic, Magritte's blue skies, colors which can't be reproduced really. Cezanne, Susan, so many muses, iPods, Picasso's, Paloma, Red Green Room, Studio, Herbert Baer, died the year I was born. Speed, money, machines, beauty, fashion, the unique work of art, go way, way, way back. The velocity of it, multi, multi, multitasking. Patrimony, patriarchy, painting, the pedigree, the provenance, what for? To say that something is true or real, a woman may have actually made Duchamp's fountain. Brock, Picasso, Apple, Dieter Rams. The museum without walls, the one you have in your mind, is more democratic 
static, actually. The pattern was invisible to us when we lived Only it. what is talked about exists. Nothing has reality until it is spoken of, written about, or displayed. But who gets to speak? Paloma. Paloma. Sarah. We accept all these images as we accept the weather. Every search, like, and click is claimed as an asset. We don't mind. The museum is a site of excess, closed upon itself, concentrated on its own name, but also forever open to the full range of its possible significations. Peach, impeach, this peach by Man Ray, which I love. Lee Miller, who was never as famous as Man Ray, but she broke his heart, though. Berenice Abbott said, I have tried to be objective. What I mean by objectivity is not the objectivity of a machine, but of a sensible human being with the mystery of personal selection at the heart of it. Berenice kind of invented the first aerial view. Eschesis, a withdrawal from the world in order to see. But we are not withdrawing. We are in everything. Red, which calls to mind a warning. Claude Cahoon said, under this mask, another mask. I will never be finished removing all these faces. Do objects instruct needs and structure them in a new way? A red glove, red head, blue body, red flag, warning. apple and apple, the weight and size of things, can you feel it through the phone? The deadening effects of a standardized culture, the unique art object comes in here. A peach, an apple, you saw That it. was good enough. I'm just going to talk a bit about my process for making those. Um, so I started with MoMA's archive, and I, as I mentioned, didn't know what to do. So I started looking through these binders that they have um, of every photo show they've ever done. And I looked at every photo show that's ever happened at MoMA, kind of as like a elaborate procrastination method, to be honest, but um, I did learn a lot about photography, I guess, um, and a lot about how the things repeat. Um, so at first I was looking at things like this, um, like the furniture. Um, I was really interested in moments where stuff would get put on doors. Um, I really liked seeing the kind of, um, the change in care over time, the way that the art objects become more kind of treated like um, very special, valuable things over time. Um, I guess they become more valuable over time. The way that photography is kind of marginalized in this er earlier era of the museum, as I guess it still is, to be honest. <laughs> um, and then I was also really drawn to kind of graphic things like these numbering systems that would appear on some of the photos and seeing different people's handwriting over time. And I should mention that um, the same photographer documented almost every show at MoMA for up until the 90s, or I think, on 4 by 5 film. So it's all these really beautiful pictures. Um, another door. I, at this point, I still didn't know what I was looking for. Um, can't remember what I liked about this. I guess I like seeing these moi bridges kind of slapped onto these cardboard things. I don't know if you can tell they're moi bridges, but like um, seeing kind of familiar things um, in the first moments they were shown. I was also really interested in thinking about how the museum kind of saw itself throughout his his, his oh my god its history. Um, that was a Freudian slip. <laughs> um, <laughs> and thinking about like how they positioned their work in relationship to the politics of the world and how they kind of put forward this um, really progress-oriented worldview that reflected this idea of America as a place where you could come and kind of make anything happen and the idea that we were sort of moving towards something and that everything was getting better and the way through it was capitalism and high art. And we kind of question those ideas now, but things like MoMA had a real hand in shaping those ideas as accepted norms and things that everyone could achieve which, or have access to, which we now know isn't true. Um, so, for example, um, they would categorize things under categories like scientific or like image of freedom. Um, and I think this kind of reflects how America saw itself as the, at this time. Um, also, there, you see a lot of these early ideas of photography as a kind of straight up index of the world that just um, kind of records without any intervention, which we kind of think about now as not really true. Like, of course, photographs are subjective and doctored, but at this time you see a lot of um, 
promotion of the idea that photography is just helping us to see more and more clearly and never obscuring anything. Um, I also just like the couch in this picture. I was thinking about like who was present in the museum, who was photographed by whom, what comes up over and over again. And then I was also just looking for my favorite pictures, like this peach by Man Ray, which was in the video, and all the different times it had been shown and how it had been contextualized. And I, and I was also looking like the back of that woman by Man Ray. Um, yeah, Man Ray. Um, I was looking for that over and over again. Um, I looked at a lot of different ways women's bodies were shown in the museum as this kind of idealized art object. Um, that there's a picture of a woman yawning there that you can't really see, but that also is in a lot of the videos. I was looking for, for example, those three Weston nudes in the middle. I was looking for them over and over again, so there they are again, like 30 years later. Um, they're way in the back there, in the middle of that door. I was looking for pictures like um, My Daughter Sigrid's Eye by August Sander, which is the far left picture. Here it is again, much later. Um, so I was also kind of allowing myself to just have subjective connections with things in the museum that I hadn't noticed before and to kind of follow those through time um, and to recontextualize them. Like I think that eye looks really different when it pops up in your phone between a bunch of different pictures than it does here framed with this big mat. Um, and and then in the end, though, I didn't use anything that I found in the binders, really. And I went to the website, which was just a really different way of accessing this archive. And I, you can just search through the site. And it's an amazing resource. Everyone should go to it. But it leaves out a lot. It's kind of a greatest hits archive version. But you can kind of filter through. Like, you can look at everything Man Ray did, which is what this is. Or I looked for every red picture that's ever been at MoMA and looked at that and made something out of that. Um, and I ended up just printing out all of these pictures from the internet and then having them all in my studio. Um, and kind of hanging, I hung a lot of them from sea stands and I made these glass planes where I was like putting them on different levels and panning over them with the camera and just kind of seeing what they would do when they were together. And that was how I figured out how to make this project. Um, I gave myself a very short amount of time to shoot with, a cam with someone helping me with the camera and I just kind of allowed whatever happened in that time to happen. Um, once I had kind of all this knowledge in my mind of the history of the museum. And simultaneously, I was doing a lot of research on museum studies, which I hadn't looked into too much before, um, and kind of anthropology related to museums. Um, and I got particularly interested in this idea of doxa, which um, Pierre Bourdieu, the French art historian, um, talks about a lot. And doxa is a Greek word which means common belief or popular opinion, and it's usually contrasted with knowledge in kind of in ancient Greece or whatever. Um, and Pierre Bourdieu kind of retook the term in, in his outline of a theory of practice and used it to mean the kind of um, taken for granted truths of a society or the things that um, seem to appear as self-evident. Um, so the doxa is kind of that which falls within the limits of the thinkable and the sayable, and then it's also the kind of shared cultural realms in which those ideas are played out and reinforced. So it's a lot like the idea of kitsch, too. And MoMA plays a big role in how these things happen in like a Western context. The art museum is a big place um, where these ideas get formed. And I was trying to think about why um, certain art even looks good to us, or does it, or um, how these ideas that a Picasso is super valuable got, um, got made and then solidified over time. And that would be a whole other talk, but um, I was thinking a lot about that. And within Doxa is the idea of the that which goes without saying because it comes without saying, so, um, which I think is a really beautiful way of putting it. Like things that we just kind of accept as true, that 
actually maybe we shouldn't. And also the idea that this is not for us, um, which is Bourdieu's words, and I think really applies to MoMA, like that we kind of self-select and identify within these structures of what's for us and what isn't. Um, and that these kind of frameworks of doxa or kitsch, for me, have been useful ways of thinking around some of those things. And I was trying to kind of access this museum in a different way through Instagram, and also to kind of equalize some of those monumental art objects and to have them kind of fly by all on the same plane, and to mix them with um, different images from different places, and with objects that aren't considered as valuable, and to sort of see what would happen. So that's that project. Now I'm going to jump back in time again. Um, and I'm going to talk about this project called Flat Death that is the first photography project I ever made after I was a graphic designer. Um, and so I was a designer for three years at the New York Times uh, right after undergrad, although I dropped out of undergrad like five times, so I was a bit older when I was doing this. but um, I was working as a designer, and I was making art at like 5 a.m. before work every day and after work, and really trying to um, do my art around this insane day job. And finally, I just decided that if I didn't have my brain to myself for a little while, I would never be an artist. So I quit, which was pretty terrifying. Um, but I was just sort of hoping I could make something happen, and I had to move back to Canada to try to get a new visa to come back as an artist instead of as a designer, because, um, yeah, it's a different visa. So I started making this work in my parents' basement while I was waiting for the visa, um, and I was lucky to have a parents' basement to make work in, but um, I was sort of pulling from stuff that was around me literally in the basement, and thinking about archives in a different way. Um, I was thinking a lot about a sort of life of images over time and how some pictures have a kind of longer life and we consider them important over a long period, like a picture of a Roman ruin. We kind of don't, we all agree, has some sort of historical value that makes <laughs> us want to keep looking at it versus something like a watch advertisement that has a very brief life in which it seems to be doing its job and seems to look good to us um, before we kind of no longer want to look at it or before it fades into kitsch or into something even sinister sometimes or depressing. Um, and I'm more interested in those types of images and in thinking about how these cycles happen and what they can sort of say about our culture as a whole. So I was looking at a lot of these pictures which are the source images for these. Which, these are these huge, like, four foot by six foot um, photographs. They're made on the floor. And they begin with these pictures of floral arrangements that I was finding in the New York Public Library picture collection at this time. And I was drawn to these pictures of floral still lifes because they really kind of wore their, um, their, the way that they had morphed over time on their sleeves. Like, they had been someone's really specific idea of natural beauty, and then they had faded both physically in the print and kind of conceptually in the way that they looked into sort of nothing that you would want to look at anymore. And I was taking these pictures and blowing them up to big four by six prints. They're all like tiled, which is a kind of graphic designer way of working, into these huge poster-sized things on the floor. And then I was remaking them out of um, objects that I found in my parents' house, as I mentioned, and in a lot of junk drawers on eBay. And I was trying to find kind of designed objects that had shared a similar fate to the um, floral still lifes that had sort of had a life or a cultural value or a kind of capitalist value and had kind of faded from view, but haven't actually disappeared. And I was thinking about <coughs> kind of a more democratic archive, like things from junk drawers and basements as opposed to, um, I don't know, the things that usually get saved in museums. And I was also thinking about how I could make a sort of monumental art picture using an economy of means. So I had kind of come up thinking that to be an art photographer, you had to have a film crew or like a huge, insane <laughs> 8x10 camera, which I do have now, but I didn't at this time. Um, and 
and they're not actually that hard to use, but it seemed really daunting to me at the time. And I thought like Gregory Crudson or Gursky or all these people who had these huge teams and made these really monumental pictures, that was how you did it, um, but I couldn't do that. So I was trying to make something just as crazy, but using what was at hand. I'm not sure I even like these pictures anymore, but I think they're important for this progression. Um, I do like these pictures. Though. These are from the same series called Flat Death. Um, these are gum display stands, and they kind of come from a similar place as the floral still lifes. Um, and I'm adding more pictures onto them, so I'm blowing up sections of the original picture as 11 by 17 prints, and then adding tons more objects onto the print, photographing the whole thing, shrinking it down to a 4 by 6 quick print, and then sticking it back on a blow up of the original image, and it kind of stuffs way more stuff into the original still life and sort of questions what it's doing at all and whether it's selling anything and um, also questions the sort of surface and the way that you see a sort of familiar image like this and think you understand it, but maybe you don't. So this whole series kind of takes from the tropes of photography, like the nature photograph, the architectural still life, the commercial still life, the portrait of a woman, and kind of reimagines all these very familiar classic picture types. Um, these, this is a still life of books, but I never actually had any of the books. They're just reprints. Um, and I was also thinking about how the titles of them kind of make a portrait of a specific moment in time, like somehow you can locate yourself um, just through a few words. Um, these ones are my architectural pictures. And I was collecting a lot of photographs of Roman ruins, and that's an Islamic dome. And I was also spending a lot of time in junk stores at this time to make the flower pictures. Um, and I was noticing that a lot of the plastic cups and Tupperware and things like that that I was finding shared a lot of the same architectural details as the Roman columns and the ancient ruins. And I was, I, which I don't think is an accident, so I was trying to kind of say something about the way that the images we consider the most valuable sort of trickle down even to our least valued garbage and how images kind of repeat themselves in unexpected places. Um, so I'm making these small scale monuments out of the found um, reimagined monuments slash plastic cups and then re-photographing them. Also, in, this was also in my parents' basement actually um, with the original picture of the ruin stuck on top and combining everything. This is a toucan. The leaves are made out of synthetic plastic post-it notes. And I was thinking about archives, I think I mentioned, like a different way of thinking about archives. So archives can be a sort of set of documents or um, a folder of things, or they can also be um, sort of similar to the idea of doxa. The, uh, Foucault, the French philosopher, saw the archive as in a more kind of political way as the things that are sayable or knowable in a culture at a given time. It's almost the same as doxa, but it's about the kind of images that get shown and that get put forward and the ones that kind of fall behind and the way that power dynamics reproduce themselves in seemingly dead materials like an old picture of a toucan or a watch advertisement. Um, and I was thinking about what kind of, for example, a picture of a smiling woman can tell us about who we think we're supposed to be as described by <laughs> capitalism and patriarchy, or what a toucan picture um, really is really saying, like, we took a lot of these pictures to be um, kind of indexes of nature, but now we know that they were taken by kind of National Geographic pho photographers who had um, often great biases and that these aren't necessarily um, objective or entirely neutral, I guess, um, views of the world. And so I'm trying to kind of point at the synthetic nature of nature photography and to kind of reimagine the surface of it and think about how even this is very constructed, even though it seems candid. Um, 
a lot of these pictures sort of look like one thing when you're further away and then change as you get closer. This is a watch advertisement from the New York Times archive. Um, and I was adding all these gold stickers to kind of stuff more gold into this already overstuffed watch advertisement and thinking about how gold is something we consider to have a kind of um, unquestioned value, but once you stuff so much gold in there, it no longer looks worth anything at all. Um, and I really like the kind of failure of this picture to look important at all because they put too much gold. Um, so I'm adding even more. There are also these pictures where I was putting um, old darkroom manuals through scanners and kind of pulling apart the colors. And then they were all displayed in rows like this. So um, again, I wanted you to kind of see a wash of familiar imagery, but then nothing is really quite what it looks like. Now I'm going to switch to video. So at this point, I went to grad school. I went to Yale for photography. Um, I made some pictures there, like this Nefertiti and this Picasso. Um, and I was just feeling like um, I was reaching the limits of photography um, in some way. This seemed like a really big problem in grad school, and now I don't really think it's a problem at all. But I was feeling like all of the research and thought that I was putting into um, my pictures wasn't really coming through in these intentionally very aestheticized, um, to me, very beautiful pictures that I was making. And I wanted to use language again, like I had in Kitchen Cyclopedia. I wanted to um, literally be able to say more. I was also feeling very frustrated in school, so I wanted to just talk about that. Um, and I guess, like, I think as an artist, you have to be okay that not everyone's going to understand or appreciate all the things you thought or all the um, intentionality behind something that you made, and everyone's going to come to it in a different way. But at this time, it felt like a huge problem, um, and I wanted to add language back in. Um, so I made this film called Rose Gold, and I'm just going to show four minutes of it because I want to show one more video, too. So. Um, it's about the rose gold iPhone, um, and I think I'll show it and then talk about it after. They invented this color, rose gold, and I'm mesmerized. A new object of desire. I totally fell for it. It's, it's almost, almost embarrassing, embarrassing enough, enough to, blush. to blush. There was a time when we were able to draw up an encyclopedia an exhaustive catalog of all the objects in the world. Since then, though, Everyday objects every possession is an extension of the My self. world is fragile. One gesture, One gesture away, away from losing all access to sustaining, sustaining the fantasies, fantasies I need. What is a good, good life when something you desire is actually an obstacle to color your The name of a color is the result of a segmenting between other colors. Orange, Orange. between and new red for and yellow. Things. I hear that the gold iPhone was for the Chinese market, where gold still really means something. Art Nouveau exploded. exploded. I, I keep, keep finding, finding watch, watch advertisements where all the clocks are set to 8.20. I read terms like Anna Digi. Well, new old terms. What time was it really? I go to check what time the Apple Watch and is I set to. I find myself wanting one. What Material kind of feel of a year or an age. Intuition is the work of history translated through personal memory. But how, how much do you fit really in the cloud? To remember. You forget when you learn to use your inside voice. When did you learn to swipe? A red gold called Arius, Arius in, in Greek. Greek. And rose revolutions, easier in the West orange, digest, pink, pink, lemon, or tulip. In every Kyrgyzstan. political gesture associated with democracy was branded with a color. Several male artists I know have told me that I am having a moment. As if the moment will pass soon. Rose Gold is having a moment too. Yeah. Things travel to their destinations. What, what is, is the, the right, right way, way to, to talk, talk about something? Do people understand more if you communicate through things bought and sold? I keep buying these plastics called melamine, evergreen, green, corsage. I find blue rose, too. Royal, yellow rose, red. Why is mustard 1970? Melamine was mass-produced as colorful by dinnerware. a corporation called American Cyanamid. This product was marketed as indestructible. Cyanamid was the sole producer of buttons for U.S. military Model clothing. Part of the reason they fell out of favor was that they stained and faded with Seafoam green, stone green, gray, rose. stained brown from coffee and I soup. I think about repetition. 
She tells me that optimism is the force that moves you out of in yourself order to be closer to satisfying world. something that you can't generate on your own. I know, I know full, full well, well you, you would do, do anything. It's the wanting, me. not the having. Same with people as in objects. Rose gold doesn't need to be anything at all. Just, Just an idea in the to air. Look forward to. A kind of metabolism of the object. The, the desire, desire to have some, to have some impact, impact on the world, on the world in, in relation to its, its impact, impact on, on me. me. The cardinal theme of advertising. So this is a bird, and this is a bird, and this is a mouse, and this is a mouse. This is a tree, and so is that. This is rose, and this is gold. What do words have to do with anything? Or pictures, for that matter. And something else. I, I love, love the, the rose, rose gold. gold divisions phone. between people and things are confused in this magical object. Out on the border between Arizona and Nevada, operated by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, Style Art Deco, opening date 1936. Rose gold is flattering to most skin tones. Rachel, dark Rachel, dark, dark. Who is and dark what is Rachel? dark, dark? Who is the voice of authority here? And who is this object actually for? So that's four minutes of an eight minute video. So Rose Gold is about a lot of things. It's heart, it's kind of a meditation on color, on the way that color is used to sell, on the kind of history um, that commercial colors and synthetically or industrially reproduced colors can hold. Um, thinking about how color kind of captivates and manipulates us, how we react differently to different colors over time. Um, what politics can be found in the way that color is used and presented in advertising and in popular culture. And I was trying to get more at that one specific facet of my work, and then that just kind of opened up to all these other things. Um, I w wanted to take the rose gold iPhone as this kind of object that's something we all already have, um, a phone, probably also often an iPhone, and connect it to other objects and images in which color had used had been used as a selling point and had been used to sell us something that we already have. So for example, I use these plastic cups called melamine, which were these kind of loved, idealized objects that were sold as indestructible. Like all the advertising for them had people dropping the cups from really high heights and they would never break, which seems kind of crazy now that we would even want a plastic that lasts forever. But um, they were sold as this kind of new revolution in dinnerware, I guess, with a lot of the same similar language to the way the iPhone was sold. Like the slogan for the rose gold iPhone was, the only thing that's changed is everything. Um, it's kind of the same, like, we're about to reach the best thing type of language of advertising. And so I wanted to connect this new thing to old things and to talk about how a lot of things haven't changed at all. Um, and I also wanted to talk more explicitly about desire um, in all different versions of it and to kind of connect a personal narrative to a more public one. Um, and at this time that the rose gold iPhone came out, I also read um, this book called Cruel Optimism by Lauren Berlant, which had a really big effect on me. And this book is about how kind of capitalism and living in a world of images and things to buy and objects um, kind of promotes this good life fantasy um, which we all think is accessible if we just keep working and buying and how we kind of need this fantasy in order to stay thrown into the world and to stay connected to um, d the desire that kind of moves us forward but this also holds us back and kind of keeps us stuck in cycles of working and buying and doesn't work out for a lot of people. So she's kind of um, talking about how we need this fantasy, but it hurts us, basically. And I wanted to talk about how, I, even though I could see how the rose gold iPhone was working on me, I still really wanted it. Um, and it seemed like a sort of vessel to talk about all this other stuff, like feminism and technology and color and power. Um, and I wanted to also connect, for example, I filmed in the Hoover Dam, um, which is this kind of more early site of American progress, and I wanted to think about that versus um, Silicon Valley, home of the iPhone, um, where, which is now the new center of American progress. Um, and yeah, there's a lot more I could say, but um, I'm gonna kind of move quickly because I wanna end on 
one more video, which is about 10 minutes long. Um, so I'm just going to flip through these really fast. But these are the photos that I made to go with the rose gold video. And I wanted to make pictures that kind of would um, reiterate the themes of feminism, technology, color power that I mentioned, um, but not repeat the images from the video. I find it really hard to make photo and video at the same time without the photos just seeming like something to sell on the side of the real work, which is the video. Um, so these are pictures of my friend Tracy. I've been photographing her for about 10 years. She's a graphic designer in New York. Um, and she's kind of posing in the same way in every picture. I wanted her to like, sort of slice across the frame. Um, and I picked her for many reasons, but partly because I feel like She's also a designer and an art director, and she kind of poses with this irony or with this idea of a whole history of representations of women in mind. Um, and I wanted to kind of combine her as a real person with all these historical images and sort of designed objects and things that had a life or were animated in the video. Um, and some of the choices are more explicit and some are less, like for example, this is a page of an encyclopedia that says a stepping forward, a stepping backward. So I was thinking that was a nice reference to the kind of slow forward and backward move of social progress. Um, but it could also mean, like, it's kind of open to interpretation. And I was sort of thinking about combining all these things in a way that you could examine for longer or that had a sort of different temporal register than a video. Um, I also made some flowers for the show. And, and then the pictures of Tracy were contrasted with kind of very cold, object-based still lifes of sort of masculine um, images. So these are Avon presidential bust cologne bottles with the heads taken off. And I wanted to make an image of this kind of line of suits that we often see in, on the news or everywhere. Um, and to kind of make an alternative image of that. And then I also made these pictures um, kind of re-collaging over these uh, 19, wait, 15th century armors that I were photographed in the 1950s that I found in 2017. And I really liked the way they were photographed. They were photographed on 8x10 with a lot of detail. So they look almost like they're rendered or they look very contemporary to me, even though they're really old. And I love when I find a kind of mashup of time periods like that. And I wanted to have this kind of reference to military power, the reference to political power with the Avon bus, and then Tracy as this real person who kind of gets affected by all of these other forces, but is still there and is more accessible than anything else. Um, and that was sort of the framework, and then I just kind of let things happen. But um, I was making this, these collages over the armors, and again, kind of reinserting things into the photographs, like with the gum stands that I showed earlier. And I wanted it to look like sort of many hands touching this kind of unmoving, cold figure, or also sort of like grasping at something that's not really there. So coming back to the idea of desire and of kind of the reaching being the thing that feels good and the actually getting it not being much at all. Um, so in this way, um, these photographs kind of are coming back to the themes of rose gold without directly pulling from the video. Um, okay, so that's everything. I'm curious about the language component. So when you referenced about looking and that sort of that film series, I, I definitely saw that in the video work. And in particular, I've always been mesmerized by the, the sort of blending that you see in his work between poetry and prose. And I'm wondering how writing itself or language more broadly plays into the way that you're working. Like, I'll read all this theory and then kind of use it however I want, um, which maybe would make some actual theory people mad, but I think is totally fine. Um, and when I realized that you could do that and that that actually might be part of making art or something a lot of artists do, it was this very freeing thing for me. Um, and I think I realized that when I started making films. Um, and so I'll just like write pages and pages of stuff. Like for the films, it'll be like 100 pages that gets recorded down to an hour and then gets edited into eight minutes. Um, so I start with like a huge amount of language and I'll 
first begin trying to illustrate specific parts of the language. So it really does start with words. Um, and then I'll kind of pick the pairing of language and images that I think works best and then kind of fill in the rest. Um, yeah. Hi, so you sort of answered my question a little bit, which is how long does it take you to make each um, video piece you make? And I know that you said like you start with like 100 pages and then edit it down to about an hour and then eventually get to eight minutes. But even with the one minute pieces, how do you take so much and condense it into so little? Like with the MoMA pieces, I was I really create a lot of parameters for myself. So I will like make a bunch of rules, like for example, that I have to do the shoot in one day. And then, um, and I shoot on film a lot, partly because it kind of um, limits how much you can shoot and it makes you more careful because it costs more money basically. And I, I don't have infinite resources to shoot on film. So I like will set all these things that will just kind of limit the crazy massive stuff that's going on in my studio and in my head. Um, with the longer films, um, I'll basically just research until it becomes too late to start and then I'll try to condense it down from like 100 pages to what's readable in an hour and all three films that I've made have kind of gone this way and then I'll have someone read an hour. I like to work with the same kind of voice of authority male voiceover guy and then insert my voice to show who's really in charge. Like I found that kind of mode of working to be effective for these pieces. Um, and so I always have him record it. And then I work with his voice, with um, the mistakes that he makes when he's reading, with the ways that he says things. He can be pretty emo, <laughs> which I like. Um, and I pick the sections that I think sound the best. And things sound so much cornier and so different. Um, and some sound better when they're spoken than when they're written. So I really can't decide anything until it's been recorded. That part's really hard. And I'll make it like 20 minutes, then 15 minutes, then 12 minutes. Then getting it past 12 minutes is always really hard. The last video is about 12 minutes. I think it's still like three minutes too long. But um, And then I start matching images, like I mentioned, and kind of filming specific shots to go with words. And then I edit it for like hopefully months, but sometimes like Rose Gold, I actually only had three weeks to make in its first iteration. And then I couldn't even look at it for a year. And I kind of revisited it a year later when I actually showed it in New York. Um, I was wondering if there was a difference between what you feel like you can accomplish in your photography versus your film. Like, what do you feel like the differences in how they connect to people and what they um, communicate is? Like, film is such a manipulative medium. It, like, you know, music and image and kind of emotions get harnessed and then kind of like used on us in film and we love it, right? Like I love that part of it. Um, and there's such a stronger capacity to sort of manipulate basically, um, which I think, you know, commercials know and advertising knows. So I've found it to be a lot more nuanced in the ways that I can try to kind of be in this space of both falling into and critiquing something, which is how I'm trying to be like, even though you're sort of in it and you can't help but escape it, you also can sort of see how it's working on you. And I think like the ability to sort of be kind of schizophrenic, for example, in the way I'm talking or the way the narrator works, I think kind of reflects the way it feels to live in these, uh, in this moment and with all these things. And then you can, also use like moving images to kind of um, show this like endless reproduction of things and everything means a little bit less because it's going by faster which gives me a lot more freedom I think. Um, but then I always come back to making photographs and I think I'd go crazy if I didn't kind of switch between the two registers. I find photography much more intuitive and film is more of a like constant head game and it feels like you can't do it and um, like your brain is about to explode, um, at least in the way that I make films. So yeah, both are important to my work. Thank you so much, Sarah. Let's give it up for Sarah Zanar. Thank you.